second one. Can you hear me? There we go. Okay, our scripture reading from this morning, first is Romans 10, 9 through 15. <clears throat> if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now then, can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Paul is quoting here from Isaiah, and that is our next scripture. Isaiah 52, verses 7 through 10. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Isn't that the hope that we're living for? The salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. So many times we think that we're not called to share the gospel. But we're called to live lives that are holy, but we have to proclaim it also. Because if we live good lives, people see good things, but they still don't hear about Jesus Christ. So we've got to tell them also. And I am so thankful that Carol, Carol is here today to tell us how she's been sharing. We're blessed to hear it today. We could give her a little applause or anything, but you know what I would like to do before she starts? Can we pray over you? Because I think that would mean more than anything. And then you get to hear from Carol. I want to say it's so good I felt just like coming home like it should have been but anyway love you guys I really do so this is a, a, a traditional chin outfit when they weave the cloth about three-quarters of the length is 
the really fancy stuff. This is the actual chin one, and that's our chin free Methodist. And then the other half is plain and a little bit of things to actually make the top. The women, and I'll have to show you. Okay, so we'll talk about Myanmar. Should be Myanmar, but it's Myanmar, formerly Burma. And uh, God had helped me learn a few words. You know, I, I can say God bless you and where's the toilet in several languages. But So I want you to practice with me. So good morning, hello, they don't have changes, it's all... Mingalaba. Mingalaba. Then thank you in Burmese or Myanmar is Jesu Timbade. I thought they were talking about Jesus because, you know, in Spanish it's Jesu. <laughs> but it's not. It's just thank you. Then God bless you. Now you don't have to practice this because it took me a long time. Peyatikin Kaunji Pebase. That's in Burmese. In Chin is Patiani Thruachuana in Pekose. Mouth. Anyway, so God bless you. So the support you sent to me helped me uh, with the ministry and the high school and Bible college. We bought a printer and a paper cutter and a laminator and all the peripheral things that go with it, stapler, and I forget what they all were able to get with the money I had as uh, one-time giving when, you, when I first went in there. So they want to say thank you. Okay, so Myanmar is between Thailand and, and uh, India, and Chin State's up on the left. I was way down south in Yangon, formerly Rangoon. Okay. Okay. So there are eight main people groups, and I just realized I forgot my paper, but I thought I knew it so well, right? But there's eight main people groups, and you can see most of the names. But like I tell everybody, I work with the Korean Baptist in the morning and the Chin Free Methodist in the afternoon, so I was both. This is a Chin outfit. I actually have a Korean outfit, too. <laughs> so um, very tribal, very, very culturally significant when you come from the different states. Even when you come down to Yangon, you identify as I'm Chin. There's very few people who are Burmese or Myanmar. And the Myanmar government has been at war with a lot of the different tribes up in the mountains. Okay. So it's 90% Buddhist, 40, I mean 4% Christianity. If those of you remember when I came back from Thailand, it was less than a half a percent. But down at the bottom you notice 95% of Chin people are Christians that brought that percentage up. Then Islam and others is 4% also. The interesting thing to me was um, Adirondai Hudson, Hudson, I never can remember, some Baptist guy from England came and was the first missionary to Burma. And he evangelized the Korean people. Well, Carsons from the United States came in 1890s. And so they took some Korean Christians with them and evangelized the Chin State. And we're way and above higher percentage of Christians. Okay? So Yangon is a population of 6 million. The trip between the two ministries I worked in were anywhere from 20 minutes with one taxi driver who was pretty outrageous to two hours when the traffic was horrible. 
But I wanted to take you up to Hakka, where, which is the capital of Chin State. Okay? So first, take an hour and a half um, airplane trip to Kalei Mio. Mio stands for city, so it's Kalei City. And next. Kalei Mio is about 400,000. There's how it's beautiful until last year with the flood. And so they had six feet of deep of rain and mud. When the rains came down, many of the houses had six feet of mud in them. So I thought, oh, goodness. But it got worse as it went up the mountain. I don't know that. Those. It was good before. The words were above the pictures. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Anyway, but this is the temporary shelters. I mean, thousands of people lived in little tarp buildings along this, that same street that you saw. The sad news is that it happened again this year. So six feet of mud on the rice fields totally ruined the harvest. And they knew they were going to have scant harvest this year. But the floods came again, broke the fields up, and now they have nothing again for the second year in a row. Very devastating. So heading out of town, uh, the mudslides were just breaking up the land. And so as you're going to drive up to Hakka, they had a hard time. So of course, price of rice skyrocketed. Took up to 40 hours to get to Hakka because they had to take horses and go all around the broken up roads. And um, you don't have your own rice that you de were depending on. And you certainly don't have any money because you didn't have any rice to sell. So you s don't have any rice, money to buy the rice. And so our, later on you'll see whoop, the rice that got brought in by the Bishop's Relief Fund. So in Calamio we have a, a Free Methodist um, International Child Care Ministries home. Okay, next. So... I go up to Hakka the first time in January, and it's 22 degrees up there. And they don't have heat. They have blankets about this thick. But you got to at least have your nose sticking out, and it was really cold. <laughs> I said, you guys have got to learn about stoves, you know? But that first trip took us about 14 hours because... It was muddy and rainy even in January, and the front axle went out, and we had to sit around for a couple of hours. But in my brain, we at least went four or 500 miles, right? Because it was 10 hours without the breakdown. Okay, Nick? Oh, no, come back. So then I went be, uh, uh, the next spring, th or a couple months later, and it was about 10 hours. And then this year, we went, and... Because of the mudslides and the construction, it was about 13 hours. And then the last time for the ladies' conference, I think we made it in 12 hours. So I'm still thinking four or 500. So I say to Pastor Puckett, well, just exactly how far is it so I can tell the people? And he said about 100 miles. And so I looked on the Internet, 107 miles. That's all. Okay. So here we are going up. I'm back in the back there with some uh, people. The lady in the middle is from Michigan. And on the left is Pastor Pa Kep's mom. And on the right is Pastor Pa Kep's younger sister who married a young guy from Michigan. You'll see his picture in a minute. He opens homes for kids who are at risk to be sold into uh, sexual slavery. They have that little boy and one on the way. So as you're going up the mountains, they're doing all kinds of terracing farming. Okay. So the tall guy is Seth, and then the mom again. And our new area, Asia area director, Eric Spengler, came on that trip this year. And he brought Pastor Sharice from India to do a teaching on church planting. So this is road construction chin style. They have a tin can with a handle, fill it with oil or tar or whatever, and the guy just walks up and down the road. 
And then the people come and they fill up baskets or those tin like walk and just spread it around. So I've shown my brother these pictures and it got cut off. Anyway, the guy's standing there. My brother said, oh, they must be the bosses. <laughs> okay. So we get up about four hours from Hakka and we hit Falam. And we have another ICCM home there. Okay. Then you get to Hakka finally. 50,000 plus. And that is now the capital of Chin State. Okay, so you're right at the top of the mountains. You're heading down into India on the other side. And it is beautiful. I was telling Bonnie last night, I said, oh, it feels like I'm in Idaho. <laughs> anyway, so up in Hakka, the mudslides caused all kinds of devastation. About 700 families lost their homes. Okay. Anyway, Myanmar was under military government from 62 to 2011, actually from 48 when the British gave them their uh, independence, they were one of the richest countries in Southeast Asia. They have jade. They're well known for their jade and pearls and gold and, and um, rubies. Are, they've got a lot of natural resources. But when they got their independence and the government tried to take care of it, things started going downhill from 48 to 62. Then 62, they got the junta government in. They closed the country. It was like a dictatorship, you know. And it was horrible. And so it was not only just horrible there in the capital, but all through the country. So the soldiers came in, and they were raping and pillaging. And as you heard from Matt and Jen, you know, they were still attacking the Korean. In fact, I found out there was only about 2011 that the Chin and the Burmese government uh, signed a peace treaty. But it was horrible for years. And we still know that there's fighting in Rakhine State and in Korean State especially. And there's many, many Burmese um, refugees in Thailand. So that is a well. Just a muddy little hole. Next. And the people had to climb up the mountains, get their water, and go back down. So living was very hard. Clear Blue Global Water Projects and donations from our church. I was bringing uh, piping in. And they find the springs and pipe it into the cities and the, uh, villages. And the bottom two pictures are when they're praising the Lord for the water projects. Up in Hakka and all the surrounding villages, they cook by wood or charcoal. Even in Yangon for the high school students, they cook over charcoal. And it's still very primitive. No phones up there. They have phones. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But no phone service. Go on. And they're down washing the dishes. But this, luckily, is a church that has water, so they didn't have to haul it. They got to do the spigot. Okay. And they have outdoor toilets, only they're squatty potties. You know, they're just a little hole in the ground with porcelain where you can put your feet. <laughs> and getting medical help from the villages is sometimes a three-hour, I mean, excuse me, a three-day walk to Hakka, where the closest hospital is. And this is how hard it is to get up that mountain in the muddy season. So we usually don't go up there then. Okay. And I saw buses and, and trucks loaded even higher with produce. And then the people were on top. But I saw that in Haiti too and saw it in Thailand up in the mountains. That's just, you get up however you can get up. Okay. So the pastors now, before, used to walk from village to village, like I said, often three hour or three day walk. And people from um, Michigan especially and other conferences have been uh, buying the pastors bicycle, motorcycles, motorbikes. The ladies in this church helped our one lady uh, pastor get her own motorbike. So she says thank you. Her name is Clay Teal. She couldn't ride it for 
a few months because she was pregnant by the time we got the motorbike tour. Okay, so I wanted to tell you a little about the Free Methodist Church there in Myanmar. The first Free Methodist Church was in 1994, and that building was the uh, parsonage and the church. It is now the parsonage. And there's a, two people on a pictures out there, a little old couple. They prayed, especially the husband, for 20 years that they could build a church so the pastor could have his parsonage. And after 20 years, people from Michigan came and built them a church. And, Ellen, this is what you get for your salary. Everybody brings a cup of rice because that's what they have. So now, in mem mem memory of Pastor Pa Kep's dad, who, who helped start the Free Methodist Church, they're building a hostel because... The Burmese government will only support two teachers in each village for grade school. If you've got 700 kids in the village, then you pay for extra teachers. Well, nobody wants to go up in the mountains. You know, if you're a teacher, you want to be down where there's electricity and <laughs> water. So it's very difficult. So they're trying to have kids come to middle school in Hakka. And then when they're in high school, they send them down to Yangon, and they have a boarding school there. The difference between a hostel and a boarding school is that in, a, in the hostel, they go to the government school and only live there. Boarding school, they actually t teach some of the classes as well as go and take some courses through the government schools. Okay. So here's a couple church planting projects. A lot of the homes are still bamboo, and some are wood. Okay. This was our annual meeting up in Hakka this year, and I'm hoping to, well, I already bought the tickets, so I'm still really hoping I get to go in January and uh, be part of it again, because the kids that I taught in the Bible college, there's several are going to be graduating. So I'm sitting there taking the minutes on my little computer and I'm seeing these guys checking their phones out and I'm going, what is going on here? Pastor Paquette told me there is no phone service. And I go to him and I said, these people are as bad as Americans playing with their cell phones in church. He says, that's the only way we can get the Chin Bible. It is illegal to print the Chin Bible. But you can download the Chin Bible app. And so Americans buy it, download it, and they're giving them out. So we know how important scripture is. And there are churches that didn't have one Bible in it. Some had one Bible the pastor had. So let's read that together because it is so important. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. People, we who have, I know I have about six different translations, don't read our Bibles every day. These people are hungry for God's word and they can't get that. And so... You're interested at all in supporting Myanmar. I've got the address for it, and it would just go to what they now call uh, community church planting or church planting development or something like that. It took the place of country shares. But all of that will go to paying our pastors. Most pastors from other denominations get about equivalent of $300 a month. Free Methodist pastors get $50 a month. So then the wives are out building the roads to make some money to feed their kids. So it's important. So the trainings you have supported. 2015, I did a child evangelism training up in Hakka. This year, I did a woman's training. But you know that on the side, and to get my business visa, I worked for... Um, 
an ACE school, and this is their scripture verse. And I use that for both those trainings, how important it is for the parents to be the teachers of their kids when you're standing and sitting down and rising up and walking along the road. Okay. So last year, most of the, your Sunday school teachers are kids, but of course the pastors have to come and make sure I'm you know, teaching the right stuff. Okay. And then this year was our women's conference, and they were very excited because nobody can afford to come to uh, another s town and have a women's conference. So when I was telling them at the annual conference that I wanted to hold the conference and I had enough money to pay the transportation and pay to feed the women for three days, and they were going to sleep in the church, they got all excited and they said, would you give us time for a WMI meeting? We haven't had a WMI meeting all together for years and years. And it's because of you guys sending me money that they got to have it. And they want you to know they are so blessed. And so there are some bookmarks out there that the ladies wove that I'm selling for just a dollar each because they want to be part of raising their own funds another woman's conference so I'm raising funds also but that's their part so good Christmas presents okay so the one down there is Slate Teal she's going to be our first women's pastor she's a conference ministerial candidate but she's been the head of women's ministry for the Myanmar Free Methodist Church for over 10 years and then the president to the left and I never can remember their names. I have to ask a hundred times and then learn how to pronounce it. So, okay. Then I do want you to know that community church planting is uh, instrumental in getting our first church plant in Sean State. And he came over and did training. He's from uh, Mumbai, formerly Bombay, India. Okay. And they had a class. Okay, and it's just them studying, learning about uh, different ways to do church planting. And then our Free Methodist Church in Yangon started in their apartment. Pastor Pak Kep said it was just the two of us. Nuta sang, and I preached. And, but she also taught, so pretty soon some of their students came. And he said in one week we'd get a little, enough money that we'd buy a chair, and then another chair. Pretty soon they had chairs for people before it was just sitting on the floor, which isn't really that strange for them. But since 2004, they now have the Light and Life Boarding School. And like I said, these kids sometimes walk three days to get to Hakka where they can get a bus to dry, ride for 30 hours to Yangon because there is no high schools up in their village. Okay. And then they have Bible College. So I taught English in both those schools, but I also uh, was able to teach some theology courses. I did uh, History and Polity of the Free Methodist Church and Wesleyan Doctrine and the Book of James. Okay. They also have outreach to their Buddhist uh, community, preschool. Uh, they're very popular because of our child care ministry monies. We're able to feed those kids. The parents think that's pretty awesome. And because of that, they allow them to learn the songs and learn to pray to Jesus. Make a big deal about graduation. So when I'm a Korean Baptist, I'm down at uh, Promise Education Center, and I acted as the secretary, but I was also the in-house pastor, and I led the chapel hours and the devotions. They also had me be the writing English teacher because even the ones that who could speak English fairly well weren't that secure in their writing. And I like to bake, so you know I baked cookies and cakes, and pretty soon they're, Can, can't you do a baking class? So we had a few baking classes. And then I did a big thing on solar cooking. And, uh, of course, I was the resident grandma, and the teachers wanted me to teach them a Bible study, so I started teaching them Bible studies also and they make a big deal of all their closings uh, at the end of school year is in February 
but then they've got March, April, May off, and they don't let kids have the whole time off. So at least six weeks of it, they have summer sessions. Okay, not only does the rain and the mud ruin the crops, but for years now, they've been inundated from rats. They ruin the forest, and they ruin the rice fields. And it's a delicacy. I'm walking to school one morning, and a guy's got this big, long pole. But I'm not really looking at what he's carrying. I'm looking at him because I want to say, Minglaba. And he, and I look down, and it's just rats. And I go, <laughs> but anyway, somebody said to me, the first church I came to, well, how'd they get all those rats? I said, I don't know. I didn't ask. <laughs> you know, pop them on the head. Anyway, this is the Bishop's Relief Fund rice that they were able to uh, buy and distribute. And that also came from your funds because I helped towards that also. We have a song, I think. Do we have that song, uh, God of the City? I, I asked for that song because cities and villages and countrysides, God is still the God of that. And things are changing. They have had Christians in the parliament before, but this year they had two vice presidents voted, and one is a, a Christian and good friend of Pastor Popkep. God is working in Myanmar. However, they have no way to grow. When Eric and I looked at their budget, and the amount of money that the churches were able to give towards the budget, we realized they were running $50,000 short just for the bare necessities. And that's when Eric asked me, would you please go around and raise awareness? Because it's really been since 2011 that we've been able to help the Myanmar Free Methodist Church. And so that's my new job, Myanmar Country Advocate. And so that's what I'm really here for and then you know I see young people like Emily who could handle the heat and humidity they need teachers they want English teachers you do not have to have a college degree if you work at the ACE school you take a week training and they would love you forever and believe me those people are so gracious and grateful but anyway, please remember to pray for the Free Methodist Ministries. And if you want to start supporting them, let me know and buy bookmarks. And if you have any questions, pay at the Kin County pay bus. No, it our. Uh, denomination still considers it a closed country we can go on there like tent makers so as if I'm an English teacher I always put I'm an English teacher and uh, it's actually illegal for foreigners to proselytize but they have quite a few evangelists that go around to the villages you know so the, the locals can, can evangelize but yes the first Christmas I was there, you know, I got there end of October, and Pastor Paul kept said, well, how would you like to preach on Christmas Day? I said, oh, that would be wonderful. You know, but I'd heard all this stuff from headquarters. You know, you be careful of what you write, and you do this, and you do that. And so he's going, no, no, it's not as bad as all that. So about eight men, very sober, come marching into church on Christmas Day. And they, ooh, treated them very, you know, respectfully and I well, who is that? Oh, that's all the city council of the of the area. And I thought oh, oh. I said, Did you forget to invite them? You really don't want me preaching to you and he goes, What a more perfect chance because <laughs> they came expecting to hear the gospel <laughs> message and this was probably the only time I could preach to Buddhists. So I did get to preach one time to the Buddhists. The rest of the time, I discipled Christians. Any other questions? Thank you for that, Jerry. <laughs>